All right, let's get started. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Marco Morelli, and I'm a co creator and editor of Metapsychosis Journal and the Infinite Conversations Forum. And we've been conducting reading groups uh, like this one, uh, which is dedicated to Sri Aurobindo's The Life Divine, for uh, a few years now, more than a couple of years. And it's really exciting to have to be doing this uh, with some new people and um, to be experimenting, I think, in a new way with how we are even, how we conduct these uh, types of, uh, I don't even know what to call it. I was thinking it's, it's kind of a study group, it's kind of a reading group, but we're not just intellectually and mentally processing a text. We're trying to go deeper into the dynamics and the being and the becomingness of, uh, of the, the space and the event itself with our intersubjectivity uh, coming into it. And so uh, we've had some, uh, I've introduced uh, some guidelines into how we might do this, but I, I think I've condensed them down into the simplest possible uh, injunctions. So I'm going to try it. Uh, number one, so three, 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 uh, three guidelines. Number one is pay attention or listen. Uh, Number two, silence is okay. Uh, and number three, don't hold back. And if we can do those all simultaneously, uh, perhaps something interesting will happen, something novel or emergent, um, or not. This is also an experiment, and I hope in the spirit of Aurobindo's own experiments, but now in this collectivity. Uh, so... We will begin with a meditation, and then Doug will lead off the conversation and the, whatever happens after that. Uh, Mateo, would you like to time us? Great. So five I'll, minutes. Five minutes, and I'll mute us all, and just you'll have to unmute yourself.
So before I do this introduction, I suppose we can do some personal introductions uh, with with you, Don, and your friend there. Um, you're currently on mute at this time. Uh, there you go. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we can hear you. Yes. Ah, okay. Hi, um, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I occasionally surf the net to see if anyone of 7 billion people are saying something new about Trier and Mendo. And I was just so delighted to see this group. It was really, I just I had so much fun going through the comments that were already up there. And Jan and I, this is my wife, Jan, we watched um, last week's Zoom session. Um, it was wonderful. It's great. And I guess, yeah, okay, second session. I guess I'll just say um, we we actually we actually met in '93, but discovered that we actually found the same Trier Bindo book in 1976, about two months apart. We both been just in love with his and the mother's writings since then. So I guess that's mm -hmm. that's it. Great. Yeah. Did you want? To? Well, I'm just happy for the opportunity to commune with other people who are appreciating Trier Bindo. He's been so important in my life for over 20 years. Uh, I'm going on 40 years, I guess. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We're, we're delighted to be here. Yes, glad to have you here, Don and Jan. Um, I too was kind of, I was introduced to the site through Arobindo doing a search for huh, just see what's out there and saw that a discussion was coming up six months uh, later and here we are. So it's very nice. I'm, we, we, everyone else here has done introductions as um, you may have noticed uh, in the previous conversations there. Mm -hmm. um, and we're each doing our own style of introduction. Matteo did his chanting, his uh, mantras. Yes. And we'll, we'll find out what I'm about to do here. Um, it's, sort of a, an embodiment of the text, I suppose. Um, but after Thursday's call, I, um, I had a, a dream. I don't often have memorable dreams, but Flo, you were in my dream um, playing piano. You mentioned you played guitar, but in the dream you were playing piano very calmly um, at kind of a storefront, all, all glass around. I was in there with you just listening and observing. And there's a big mob coming at us outside, torches and all the, the typical mob setting. And they begin to kind of punch through the glass and break it. And I'm feeling pretty anxious, but you're sitting there very composed and still playing after the glass shatters and everything. And so I was kind of intrigued when I awoke from the stream and um, I put a few pieces together. And 10 years ago, when I first read The, the Life Divine, um, I, I was intrigued with Auroville, and in a sense, that's kind of its own island, even though it's not an island in actuality, but it, it's its own island sitting around the outside world, much like Aldous Huxley's book, The Island. Um, it's a spiritual community, and I fell in love with it at the time, but I, I fell out of love with, with the community because... I, I heard of crime and just outside influence and corruption, money, this and that, all, all types of typical human stuff. And I felt that was a good place to start with this conversation, which starts with man and the universe, ego and the dualities. Um, and as I often do, some of you know here, I, I kind of have a conversation with the text, but I created our world. So this was kind of the, the business gurus coming in and seeing the opportunity to kind of bank on the spiritual community. Um, so there's, there's a central shrine with a hologram of our Obendo, And then there's six kind of, there's six uh, paths that lead to the central, I think it's called the Matra Mandir, mm -hmm. the, the kind of golden globe. Um, so that's where our Obendo sits. And, but there's, there's six, uh, paths that you can take to get there and that which they're kind of i'm getting off topic here but there's aromatics aerobotics is the technology 
-hmm. Instead of Sanskrit, they learn Arabic. Uh -huh. um, and it's not to be confused with the aerobics, the spiritual exercises. There's mind bindos, there's aerobatics, which is the vertical self-management, kind of like the philosophy of Slaughter Dyke, you must change your life. Um, but from this, and you'll have to bear with me for a little bit here once I get into it, but um, there's the first quote from the Upanishad in Man and the Universe that starts with, the soul of man, a traveler, wanders into this cycle of Brahman. Huge, a totality of lives, a totality of states, thinking itself different from the impeller of the journey. Accepted by him, it attains its goal of immortality. So, I, our, our character in this poem about, I'm about to read is named Aro, and she, she is a traveler kind of on a search. She's having an existential crisis. Um, but our traveler, we aptly named Aro, the clothes on her back she did borrow, enters into the Aro world, a spiritual material world unfurled. She stays for only today and gone tomorrow. Come in, come in, experience Aro world, the spiritual material world unfurled. You can stay here year after year. Come in, come in to our aural world. Come in, come in, experience our world, the spiritual material world unfurled. You can live life without any strife. Come in, come in to our aural world. So she arose at dawn with Puissantian and stepped up to the well-kept lawn, side of pure grandeur, all paths rectilinear and into the central shrine she is drawn. Corridor after corridor, door after door, feet upon the floor, floor after floor. The central shrine, a dark room shine. Hushed in time, Haro begins her rhyme. This is Man in the Universe. Day after day, year after year, I fear my time is near. What am I doing here? I am a woman in the universe. Why does this exist? What is its purpose? Why does it persist? Now this is the Aurobindo hologram. <laughs> um, so he says purpose, the progressive revelation of a great, a transcendent, a luminous reality with the multitudinous relativities of this world that we see and those other worlds that we do not see as means and material, condition and field. This would seem then to be the meaning of the universe. Why does it exist? Satchitananda is the unknown, omnipresent, indispensable term for which the human consciousness, whether in knowledge and sentiment or in sensation and action, is eternally seeking. What are you doing here? Why does all this persist? The universe and the individual are necessary to each other and their ascent. Always indeed, they exist for each other and profit by each other. The universe comes to the individual as light, a dynamism, the entire secret of which he has to master in a mass of colliding results a world of potential energies out of which he has to disengage some supreme order and yet some unrealized harmony. The ego and the dualities. I understand your vision of purpose, but I am a, such a bundle of contradictions, cycling trivialities. Day after day, year after year, I fear I cannot see clear. Am I far? Am I near? How do I live without fear? see harmony so clear and so near. All is in truth, Satchitananda. At first, we must strive to relate the individual again to the harmony of the totality. It is not very easy for the customary mind of man, always attached to its past and present associations, to conceive of an existence still human, yet radically changed in what we are now, 
our fixed circumstances. And on to the methods of Vedantic knowledge. The dualities experienced year after year, I now see clear. Yet is a path near, free from fear, right now, right here. What then is the working of this Satchitananda in the world, and by what process of things are the relations between itself and the ego? To correct the errors of the sense mind by the use of reason is one of the most valuable powers developed by man and the chief cause of his superiority among terrestrial beings. The sovereign action of the sense mind can be employed to develop other senses besides the five, which we ordinarily use. And the pure existent conscious force and delight of existence. Um, I kind of trailed off here. I, I haven't officially finished, so maybe I'll stop there. Um, but I don't have much else to say. I appreciate everyone listening. I hope I haven't steered this off course or <laughs> into the ground. So thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Doug. And I suppose just as I don't know who's supposed to be guiding the conversation, um, even though I'm introducing here, I, I'm coming from a phone, so I can only see two or three of you at a time. So um, I won't be able to, to help with uh, kind of the process of speaking there. So maybe you, Marco, would like to take on that role. Sure. Well, just unmute yourself. Uh, this is to everybody if, uh, to participate, to say something, uh, and, and see that if, uh, if you can, if you have a, a big enough screen, see the mute status of everybody else. So when somebody else unmutes, you can anticipate that they're going to uh, jump in. I just have one question. Uh, what happens to Oro world? What, and what happens to Oro after she has this encounter with the hologram of Aurobindo in the center of Oro world? So I did have a final uh, rhyme which I'm, I'm skipping over the, the quotes from the last three chapters. It's a bit extensive and it's, it was hard to find one kind of particular quote from the chapter to fit with what was going on here. But she, so the sounds of delight resound in the light as our dear Aro calls it a night. The cacophonous shrine, glistening silences shine like all combinations of noises and delight. So she's kind of left in maybe a revel revelatory mode. She's still there in our world. Um, the world is still going on around her. Um, so we'll, we'll see. There's a lot of book to cover here. Uh, well, <clears throat> one thing I'm just aware of is, uh, at least personally, the sense of challenge in uh, embodying uh, on a daily basis the kind of vision that Aurobindo is speaking. And uh, certainly amidst these cycling trivialities, which uh, can certainly catch me up um, and maybe others. So I guess that's just a general uh, kind of question I have. I don't have the answer, but just as an inquiry uh, for myself that I'll try to take forward over the next week. Um, can, can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, I want to comment on the chapter later, but I, I wanted to really 
heartfully thank Doug. Is it Doug? Is his name Doug? Yeah. I wanted to thank him. Um, Jan and I have been watching the Indian um, Chirabino community, actually the community around the world, and we love it when folks cannot take can see our foibles and not take ourselves too seriously. So I, I really was sort of smiling and appreciating the whole oral world story. So thank you. I would like to say that I think that in a speculative kind of sense, uh, sort of futuristic mindset, we could imagine a future where not exactly Oroville per se, but the functional equivalent of that was an actually economically viable type of enterprise. Like there's a school of thought, which I know you're aware of, Doug, and I wonder if it influenced your poem called quote unquote meta modern modernism, which I'm not going to try to fully characterize it, but it's sort of a fusion of modern values with spiritual and ecological values. And one of the um, pr proposals or uh, uh, claims uh, or just suggestions that, that some meta-modernist thinkers make is that when society as a whole, a global society, gets to a level materially of, and, and this is, of course, utopian. <laughs> but when it gets to a level of material sufficiency, right, where we kind of figure out certain levels of existence and how to manage a planetary civilization. And you can, you know, they, they point to examples, imperfect, certainly, but um, close, you know, in the right direction type of examples, in, in their view, uh, in, say, Scandinavia, where there's a social welfare state and various other institutions to support more of the interior and psychological and cultural development of the people. The idea is that when we would reach that stage as a human civilization, we, our, our economic needs would shift into this other, into these subtler realms, let's say. And then, uh, it, then what would become valuable to us wouldn't be necessarily the exterior symbols or material conveniences or comforts that you know are available because those would already be taken care of by you know ai and nanotechnology and and whatever else but it would become really a value where uh, the the play of economic exchange would take place is in the psychological and spiritual realm and it would become uh, as zachary fetter suggests this in a piece uh, we published uh, why the human singularity is nearer he called it it would become uh, a, uh, a status symbol to be spiritually developed. Uh, and, and so for a, 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 an enterprise like Auro World or something like it to arise uh, would be maybe a good business opportunity, right? Somebody would, per, would anticipate that market, quote unquote, and uh, attempt to capitalize on it by promising the best technologies, the best processes, you know, the, the best teachings for realizing absolute reality and uh, a divine life in, in, in this incarnation, right? So um, I don't think it's so far off. And, and it's not actually too different than what we can already see in the, um, some of the, the marketplaces, like the spiritual marketplaces uh, in contemporary life. So there's something to that. And I think, uh, and I, I did forget to mention that the gift shop shop sells RO postal clothing and, uh, <laughs> RO medics. <laughs> but anyways, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I, I, that's, uh, I, I, it's clever and it's, you, you might be a great, uh, marketer for RO world <laughs> by, you know, uh, becoming a brand manager or something for a line of Oro products. Um, but I think it raises a question of really what is the depth behind the depth or what's the depth behind the, the surface that is promised to us through this kind of engagement, right? Wherever it is, here or in any other context, 
we're seeking something perhaps right and uh and so is, but is it the real thing i that might be one of the questions that i that i hear in your piece but what i hear i think you're a reincarnation douglas of um alexander pope with all the, it sounds almost like uh, these rhymed couplets that you seem to be very attracted to of course pope was famous for that. I think he was neoclassical, but he was also a, a, a great wit and very intellectual and, and um, was good at spoofing and making fun. And uh, so that's what I, that's what I got from your, uh, your poem, a great deal of charm. Um, but I think there's a seriousness to Alexander Pope. And I, I think there's a seriousness to you as well, because I know you're very aware that of the nothingness, the emptiness. And um, I'm, of course, very attracted to the never. Um, but I think that that's what I, uh, I think our author here is really examining all of that. And for me, it's um, a, a musical experience. I mean, uh, it seemed like, and I can only compare it, to me, it's like uh, listening to, and I listened to it a little bit today, of Mahler's Eighth Symphony, the Symphony of the Thousand. I think it was, it's based on a, a Faustus, a Faust, Goethe's Faust. So you have a, you know, a thousand chorus members and you have some soloists who are all singing from basso profundo to, you know, soprano. And they're all uh, taking on um, these archetypal characters, these very grand characters. And um, and they're all singing their hearts out with a full orchestra, and it's um, and an organ, an organ blasting away. And I think the challenge. I think I was listening to a conductor. He said the the challenge of, of conducting Mahler is you have to figure out where the climax is, because there's so much there's so many waves of such enormous intensity. Um, that is, but he said there can only be one climax. You can't have a thousand climaxes. So you have to find where that one climax is. You know, you have that rising action in a play. There's a climax and then there's a, there's a, a falling off. And then there's a great satisfaction that the performers and the audience uh, take with them from that kind of uh, experience. And to me, that's where uh, I feel in each, each chapter, I feel like, I mean, paragraph after paragraph. I mean, usually I underline a sentence, but I was just underlining entire paragraphs because I couldn't believe how beautiful it was. And I was like, oh my God, this is the first couple of pages and I'm already like, um, you know, uplifted on the wings of a dove. You know, where can you, how far can this go? You know, and I'm just, you know, I'm just 50 pages into this. We have a lot more to go. Um, so for me, it's um, a great relief, and I know, and I know, and and I call, and I think of Mahler because he was also at the end of the of that great century and the beginning of the next, where uh, I think um, Aurobindo reached his maturity, and um, and he came back uh, to his native land after being in in England and being educated there, and then. Um, reorganizing himself um, in that great political upheaval that was going on. Uh, and his mystical experiences occurred while he was in prison. And uh, I thought it was very poignant that he had, he was, had great conflicts after those, uh, those waves of realization, how to get involved in um, that political struggle. Um, because he saw, he seemed to, uh, see through uh, so many of these, um, these dynamics. And um, he, was he was persuaded by his, his teacher to continue the struggle because there was a huge uh, gathering of people um, who were eager to hear him, to hear this great revolutionary speaker um, inspire them. And here he was like, after his spiritual awakening, he said, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> you know? But he was persuaded by his teacher that it was his duty to do so. And he was walking up 
the aisle, he reports that some guy had had a paper, a newspaper open, and was reading the newspaper, and he his he caught a glimpse of some something in the newspaper that made really clear to him um, what he was going to speak about. And uh, when he got on stage, he just sort of basically was channeling information that did inspire his audience. So I see this as a tremendous, uh, uh, really a channeled. I feel like this is channeled. Um, Obviously, there's a personality there, and he's using a great deal of uh, um, artistry, and he's definitely trained himself in, in many disciplines. But I, I just found myself um, extremely relieved. Um, as a, and I know that he said that his, uh, he believed that um, T.S. Eliot was uh, an integral poet, and I think he also marked out um, Rilke. Um, that's what I've been told. I haven't found the the source of that in any of his writing yet, but I've been reading about his uh, a book of his on future poetry. But I think he's um. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, he quoted the, something um Eliot said about you can have the experience. We had the experience and we missed the meaning. I think that's that's the line. And I've always felt that that was true in my own case. And I felt that sort of malaise that I think Elliot was very good at, of having had the experience but missed the meaning. But now as I read Aurobindo, and I'm really glad that I didn't read him when I was younger, because I think I would have made too many premature conclusions. But now as I'm older and have had lots of experience, I can, um, I'm very relieved that I feel like, oh, I've had some, I've had a lot of those experiences that he's described. And now Aurobindo is giving me guidance because now I, I have a sense of how it, it all falls together and it's starting to have, and I'm sort of getting the meaning of it. So to me, it's, um, it's sort of thrilling to have, you know, these, all these puzzles, this puzzle has been tossed up into the air and all of a sudden it's fallen down and, and uh, just been disarray. And now I can all see how this piece fits with that piece and that piece fits with this piece. And, there's a border over here, you know, and I can get a, I'm getting a sense of um, an aesthetic pleasure of almost like each chapter seems to be putting, putting another piece of the puzzle together. And I realize this isn't, this isn't something that just belongs to me. It belongs to all of us, uh, but that each of us is going to have our, uh, our own unique kind of configuration. So anyway, those are my initial responses. I just am thrilled by this text, overwhelmed with joy. And, um, I think he has a lot, he, I think he was way ahead of his time. He's way ahead of our time. And I think in some ways, um, he reminds me of the emissary and the master and the emissary. Does, do we know that book? It's by Gilchrist. He's talking about the left brain and the right brain. And I'm just gonna quote one paragraph and then I'll shut up. <laughs> but there's this wonderful, um, it reminded me so much of Gilchrist um, when he was talking about the left, the functions of the left brain and the functions of the right brain how the right brain, which he considers the master, has been usurped by the left brain, which is basically running amok. And I think, uh, um, I think uh, Aurobindo is saying something very similar, and this is way before anyone, he didn't know anything, I'm sure, about the brain or what we know about neuroscience. He says, for the highest intuitive knowledge sees things in the whole, and the large and details only as sides of the indivisible whole. Its tendency is towards immediate synthesis and the unity of knowledge. Reason, on the contrary, proceeds by analysis and division and assembles its facts to form a whole. But in the assemblage so formed, there are opposites, anomalies, logical incompatibilities, and the natural tendency of reason is to affirm some and to negate others, which conflict with its chosen conclusions so that it may form a flawlessly logical system. And it goes on to, you know, to um, elaborate the, the tensions between the, the intuitive the capacity to take in the whole and that, that logical uh, drive, the rational, to have everything sequenced and, and linear. And um, I think he, he, he does recognize that there's a great threat that the reason can, um, as, as important as it is, it can usurp its, its role in this partnership with intuition. So I think he's being um, extremely prophetic there. So 
I can't wait to to get, get to the rest of this. It's just to me, it's a, I'm just zipping through it, you know, and I can't wait to reread it. So thank you. I wanted to leave more space since I just talked, but I wanted to have a quick chance to respond to what you just read from the Gilchrist. There no, this wasn't from Gilchrist. I read this from Arbendo. Ah, okay. But I had quoted Gilchrist because I, right. I saw the resemblance between what I thought Gilchrist was talking about right. and this quote. There, there's an early text that Triabino wrote on education. He was still principal of a small college in Barod, and he writes exactly what McGilchrist is saying about left and right brain. He writes, there are two, two very, very different faculties of the intellect. One is linear, analytical, it sees the parts, it misses the whole, and one is comprehensive, it embraces everything, it's, it's metaphorical, it's poetic, and it's very, very much, very much in line with the way we're trying to read the life divine. That we're going to make use of our critical reason, but if that reason becomes the master, we're going to lose the music and the delight and the ecstasy. Can, can I just quote one more thing? Because I think this uh, resonates with what you've just said. Uh, in the a paragraph right above the one I just read, he says, um, the question asked by one sage of another is, what dost thou know? Not what dost thou think? Nor to what conclusion has thy reasoning arrived? Nowhere in the Pashanashads do we find any trace of logical reasoning urged in support of the truths of Vedanta? Intuition, the sages seem to have held, must be corrected by a more perfect intuition. Logical reasoning cannot be its judge. So that gives us hope. Because <clears throat> I think we're in this deficient middle structure, as Gebs would say, where um, that quantifiable kind of science that, that only sees the real in what they can measure, uh, that dominant trend which Gebs are called the deficient, um, I think is uh, usurping it, its, its role. And I think that uh, it may be collapsing um, as we see all around us, this enormous disarray, certainly in, our, in the governing class and in this globe, all these global initiatives um, to take over, but without balancing intuition and what's appropriate for the whole. Um, and I see these tensions are really inflamed and amplified in our current uh, situation. So it's a great blessing that I think that we we have Aurobindo to uh, sort of be our guide because I think he he recognized this uh, in his own time, and I think he was writing for us. I think we're the future that he was writing for. Um, maybe I could just say something just briefly about the science side in terms of what some of my experience has been um, in graduate school participating with the uh, Mind and Life Institute, um, which was started by uh, the Dalai Lama and uh, French neuroscientist named Francisco Varela. And out of that, um, you know, has come this whole a new field of contemplative neuroscience. Um, and it's, you know, it's got a fair grounding. There's quite a few uh, scientists, certainly of my generation. I'm not a scientist, but I did some scientific work, but of my generation that are kind of working on this uh, now. And also, um, you know, just recently in the last couple of years, had the opportunity to, to work with one of the scientists in particular around you know, this idea of states of consciousness and structures of consciousness. And so that, that is actually starting to be researched as well um, uh, by this one fellow, uh, Dr. Dave Vagel, who was formerly at Harvard. He's now at Vanderbilt, um, research director there. So uh, I just want to say there's some encouraging things happening on the scientific side as well. Um, when it's brought together with the contemplative side.
Yeah. yeah. I think that's a very healthy trend that you just spoke of, Derwin, uh, where I think the um, that reductionist tendency um, in a lot of science is being ch is being challenged within the within various fields of science. Like our friend Jeffrey, who's a physicist, I think it's very important for him to be a bridge between the the humanities and the and the science. And I think that many are, are feeling that calling. Um, and I, I think the, there's a great suggestion here over and over again of the, um, of, you know, when we talk about science, we know now about brain waves and beta and um, alpha and theta and delta, um, delta being deep sleep and theta is dream and um, reverie is alpha sort of in, in a meditative state. And of course, beta is that very the highest frequency, which we associate with a with a waking, and I think he uses the term waking mind, but um, I think it's very clear to him, um, even though he doesn't have that vocabulary that I'm just using or, or knew much I think about brain science that um, that uh, we we were caught in this we're in we are definitely in a culture now and probably was back then a, a monophasic culture we we recognize the waking state and reality is based upon that very tiny sliver of what's actually going on. Um, so I think a more mono, a uh, more polyphasic culture, which we've discussed here many times, uh, is a real possibility if we can learn how to train our attention and to be uh, hyper, become more aware of uh, these other, uh, these other waves and we can orchestrate them and, and uh, develop them through our attention, um, through meditation. And he mentions hypnosis, which I've been a practi practitioner of for years. And I think there's um, a, a, a great uh, opportunity for us um, taking his lead um, so that we can maybe find a way of, of uh, creating that vision logic that the integral sort of promises. I think he, I think it was Gebser called it the highest, the higher octave of all the previous uh, structures. So I think that way maybe um, we're in the, this big transition um, that seems very turbulent and uh, difficult, but that uh, I think these, uh, if we can train our attention, I think we have a, a lot of untapped potentials and I believe that Orbindo has realized and that we could start to realize too, if we read him, and I think in an, in an imaginative way. So thank you for that, Derwin, that gave me a prompt. One of the things I loved about um, one little small piece in the text was he talked about how our, when we use our senses, he used this metaphor about how how our mind grows up. When we use our senses, the sun is going around the earth. But when we use pure reason, uh, the earth is going around the sun. And um, that reminded me of your comment, John, about um, the uh, uh, delta, theta, alpha, beta. Uh, because... Um, the descriptions that we usually hear with those brain waves are are the brain waves of adults. What we don't often know is that a baby is in delta all the time, waking, dreaming, and sleeping. Their eyes open, closed is always delta, and that other brain waves are there, but they're on the bottom. I mean, they're underneath that, and. Uh, then they gr gradually grow into a theta and gradually grow into alpha and then they gradually grow, grow into beta. And uh, meditators frequently are doing their very best to get back down to delta because they feel like that's the, the place that their meditation is going to get them back into, you know, uh, b basic reality. But some of the most recent research on meditation um, is indicating the which Dan Brown has just done uh, working with um, 
the uh, uh, people who are realized, the people who have 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 uh, had the first stage of awakening in his work, uh, actually have gamma uh, brain waves. So I think we. Uh, I'm I'm just interested in in what I'm most interested in in Aro Bindo is how he uses his polar opposites and how he makes those things always grow up. Nothing seems to be final, and um, he even says, you know, how will the ape be able to imagine? How would the ape even begin to imagine um, what a human being's consciousness would be like? And I think about that every time I hear something about the singularity because we're looking at all of the technology and there are some people who think that the next human is going to be a combination of, of the um, um, technology and the human form of some kind and that the brain and mind will have all the advantage of these technological capacities. And yet I think of, of myself and... and uh, others and try and imagine what it would be like if I were an ape trying to imagine what what the next developmental form would be like. And I somehow don't get technology as being that process. I, I, I'm always thinking about how it seems like every time we go, like when we go from our sensory world to the reasoning world, there's a complete flip of, you know, like the the sun going around the earth rather than the earth going around the sun. And we can't see with the level of attention or consciousness that we're at. And every time we get to the next level, it seems like there's a, a complete flip-flop of everything that we believed and finding, you know, the belief itself is a creation uh, of our own minds. And how do we get past that creative aspect of our own minds, which Aurobindo is so firm about talking about? He, he is one who defines every word because he knows that in our own minds we're going to construct the meanings of all of our words all by ourselves. And so people talk at each other and we're like ships crossing in the night because we are constructing our own meaning and we're using words and other people are constructing their meanings. They're using words and I've got a different meta, a different definition to the same word that they have. And so we think we're in conversation when really perhaps we're not as much as we would like to believe we are. So, um, uh, I mean, Aurobindo does, uh, I notice in his writing, he, he sees to it that he is defining his words such that he's, I suspect he's just hoping we'll understand what he means by these words uh, very clearly. And, um, uh, and then he uses all these opposites, like the first chapter we were reading really to me was about the individual and the collective, and uh, then he, he had, uh, you know, then he went through this series of, of reasoning, you know, going from the sensory to the reasoning and the flip-flops that he was making as he was showing how we were growing up through these, these different levels. And, um, and then he had, uh, he was playing with the word delight. Exactly what is it? Is it Lila? Is it Maya? Is it, you know, um, how do we put all that together and make sense of it? And, uh, we use the word illusion, but, you know, there really is a real world out here. It's not a, an illusion. We feel our bodies. We sit in our chairs. So uh, to me, Aurobindo is, he is trying to tell us that there's something beyond the, the place, at least tell me that there is something beyond the place that I'm sitting right now and think that I'm knowing and there's some other flip that's going to happen when I finally wake up to the next place that he's desperately trying to show me through the definitions of his words and the, the playing around with his sense of delight and all of these other places that he tries to take us. Thank you. I'd like to thank you, Terry. I'd like to play off what several people spoke about um, Derwin brought up contemplative neuroscience. Terry, I love the way that you brought out 
the way that Sherbino is always confronting us with these apparent polarities or contradictions and sort of inviting us to go beyond. And I wanted to play off something that John said about Mahler and the climax. And I don't know, maybe I can bring in oral world, I'm not sure. But there's a section I've always loved in the chapter on delight, where he says, normally, the way humans living in their little selves, their little selves opposed to the world around them, meet the context of the world in three ways. Through pain. So, and he says, our little self can't, we don't know how to meet these contexts. And so we in our little selves experience this as pain. Or we grab at, so if we're in our little self listening to Mahler, we might be like, oh, I love this section. Wouldn't it be great if it lasted forever? Then I'd be happy. And so we're looking for pleasure. Um, or we're in our sort of normal flat state, barely conscious, which he calls being neutral. So we have pleasure, pain, neutrality. So Derwin mentioned contemplative neuroscience, and I, I did my dissertation on mindfulness and pain. And what inspired me was in the early 90s, for about two years, I had this grueling toothache that kept coming back. And I kept going to the dentist and I, I couldn't work it. And it's interesting, Shirobindo in the late 30s was working intensely with transforming pain. He said the hardest thing he found was toothaches. So one day I decided I had some medication. I'm not going to take it. And I just lay down in the bed and just sat totally present with the pain, which first was just like this grinding, you know, torturous, you know, constant pangs of pain. I just said, I'm going to be with it. And in order to be with it, this gets back to his chapter, you almost, your awareness has to be large enough that, that what you're experiencing as an object of pain is no longer separate. And so there was a certain point where the pain became this just intense ball of energy that was no longer painful. And I stayed with it. And at some point, it became like that Mahler, a Mahler-like climax of this incredibly delicious, ecstatic, joyful energy. And I could, at that point, I could see that the instant my awareness slipped back into little me, I was like, oh, my God, it's the pain again. So he says that, and Sri Aurobindo in the chapter says, knowing that there is nothing but Brahman, we, we shrink into this little self, this avidya, this ignorance, and react then to the context of the world in terms of these three modes. But when we recognize all of us here, all of us, as this constant unfolding creative flow of Brahman, it's all delight. Which he says, I, I love that, uh, um, I forget who it was who said in the beginning, we shouldn't just do the problem, we should have the solution to so, you know, there it is. He just, he's given it to us. It's like, as long as we perceive a contact, any sensory contact, through like the medial prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that creates this little self. And some of the, some of the people doing experiments where they go into this sort of open state, the parietal lobe gets so quiet, they're not located in space. And suddenly you're, you're embracing all contacts as one. Delight. Hey, um, I really like what you're saying about that. It reminds me of um, my birthing experience and how I'm just so grateful for my midwife who was there to guide me through my contractions because there's points in which the pain was just so intense. I'm like, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> and I felt like stabbing in my back. And I just, I started actually like convulsing in my back at times because the pain was so intense. And she would just sit with me and lock eyes. And as she noticed the contraction coming on, she would take a deep breath and just guide me to breathe with her. And that centering of my awareness made the contraction like you were saying like almost delightful 
Um, and the pain wasn't there, at least not in any form in which I was experiencing it before. Um, you know, and then like you're saying, it's this like ecstatic bliss once you find that, that peace and centeredness with it. And, um, and of course in the birthing experience, then I have this joyful little being to hold in my arms afterwards. Um, but it reminds me of this quote from, um, so chapter seven, right? Yeah. Seven. Um, where Arbindo says, states of consciousness there are in which death is only a change in immortal life, pain, a violent backwash of the waters of universal delight, limitation, a turning of the infinite upon itself, evil, a circling of the good around its own perfection. And this not in abstract conception only, but in actual vision and in constant substantial experience. I think people would pay money for that for the delight of existence <laughs> is this the connection to our world maybe <laughs> I um, don't at all mean to make light though of, of the experience um Maybe capitalism will become uh, a delightful uh, phenomena in, in, in a future where spirituality and materiality are are united. Um, I promised that I'd open up the waiting room or open up the space at the top of the hour, and we do have somebody waiting, uh, Kim. Uh, so I'd like to let her in. And maybe just take a moment to let her get in sync with us and then continue. Hey, Kim. Hello. So if you can hear me, Kim, uh, we have been um, talking just most recently about the uh, delight of existence, uh, but we got to that uh, through the pain of existence as being one mode in which an in egoic individual meets, encounters, or experiences the world. And... We have a, a new participant here, Don, who, who shared about uh, an experience that he had with uh, acute tooth pain and uh, meditating with it and sort of breaking through or moving through the pain experience into a bliss experience. And, and then Lauren uh, shared about her birth experience uh, as... Um, Hey, uh, an example of uh, of that possibility. So, I'm not sure if you heard what I just said, but now that we can see you, would you like to say hi? I I mean, audio wise. Sure. Hello. Is that, you mentioned a family emergency? Is everything um, okay? Yeah, my, my dad is suffering from vascular dementia, and he had a fall on Monday, and he sort of um, lost most sort of functionality in terms of being able to, like, feed himself and that kind of stuff. So um, we've been just having to check up on him more and make sure that um, he's taken care of. So okay. he's doing good. I mean, he's in good spirits. He's just sort of, you know, on that decline. Hmm. You want to uh, just talk about your reading and like you know where you're at in <laughs> in this reading process, this group process, just so we kind of get in sync a, a little bit. Sure, um, I'm reading very slowly. In fact, I'm having to repeat 
things quite a bit. So I'm um, several chapters behind at this point, but I'm reading every day and uh, I find myself sort of mesmerized by his writing, but I kind of have ADD too as I read and I'm like, oh wait, what's the argument? And then I have to start back over again. And I think that Matteo was sort of pointing to this. Um, and I'm noticing like there's an, a, an accountability when I sit down and read his work to actually understand what he's saying. Um, I almost need to be in a certain frame of mind. So it's constantly almost every day, like forcing me to a place where I'm in a deeper sort of place of clarity for this level of um, sort of understanding. And so I find the accountability uh, of returning to the work every day and just going at the pace I can go at um, to be very challenging, but also necessary for me because there's accountability in it. It's just sort of, I don't always immediately like go right into the reading where I can understand it. I oftentimes have to sort of read the page again and then go, I, I doesn't really feel like I'm fully in sync and then I'll just read it again. And I've found that just like I said, I'm really excited about the opportunity to have some accountability to stay there every day, even if I, you know, wander in and out of the capacity to really, you know, take words and, and, and sit with it in that way. So I like it. And also in the beginning, he talks so much about sort of, um, I feel like some of the spiritual delusions that we go through when we have different state experiences. Um, and I just thought he was so gentle and sort of like pointing out different ways in which we can misunderstand things. And I thought that was a really nice way to start out his writing. So I feel like um, even though I'm going slow, I'm getting a lot out of it already. So thank you. I, I've been worried about the pace. Uh, you know, I can read fast if I need to, but I don't really like to. I, I personally like to go slow and I like to relish and savor what I'm, what I'm reading. And I also like to understand it before I, before I move on. And so uh, it's, you know, I, I made a schedule because it's useful to have that logical, you know, linear framework to organize a, a group like this. Uh, but I, I also I tried to try to emphasize that we could adjust it and that we don't have to finish the whole book, you know, in a certain time frame. Um, I like what Matteo said, I'll reiterate it uh, earlier, that it's a, a, kind of, a kind of fractal book in the sense that you can dive, d dig into any piece of it and find some aspect of infinite depth. And that, that's been my experience as well. Uh, I also, it also seems to be a somewhat state-specific understanding that, that uh, one can have, or at least I, I've been having, where it seems like, oh, I understand it. I get it. The pure existent is all that is. The only, there's no argument <laughs> against uh, ultimate being. Uh, and that makes total sense when I'm in that state of, of resonance with, with the language. Uh, but I step away or walk out my my room or... I interact with my family and that sense of that intuition of absolute being uh, seems to dissipate a bit. So, <laughs> and perhaps rightly so and naturally so, uh, but it, it has been, as you said, sort of a discipline in a way to come back to it day after day and to um, also bring a, recall it to mind in moments when I'm not reading and see, can I, as I'm here going to the bathroom or as I'm cooking something or uh, I'm working on a, a floor in our house, uh, can I mm, feel that a little bit, like t touch into that a, a little bit? Because uh, it's also a bodily thing, right, that it flows through. So that's the conscious force, uh, which I, I had some trouble with, honest, honestly. I didn't. I was like, what is the conscious, what is the force, 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 la forza del destino, or um, I, it's just not a term that was really familiar to me, and, I've, and I didn't understand how to understand it. So I, I'd love to hear from folks who have not yet, uh, I, this is just what I, I, who have not yet spoken, if they would like to, uh, I want to create a 
offer a space for that. And if not, then anyone else can uh, continue. I'm really, really enjoying the conversation. Wow. How special. I've appreciated everything that everyone has said. Uh, and I'm appreciating how much uh, um, resonance everyone is having with this, with this text. Wow. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I really don't. Uh, there, there, are, there are some things that are that have jumped out at me that I've never seen before, and I, I, I think Terry was talking about him toggling between the logic of the infinite and the logic of the finite. The finite determinable and the indeterminable infinite is a pattern that he goes to over and over again. And the the one thing that has been kind of a useful process through this reading is. He makes the analogy about content and continent and then compares that to existence and existent. Uh, I love things like that. It's just something that my mind can go silent with. Yeah, there's so much to these chapters that we've just read. I'm reading them twice this round just because I want to. I, I really have to. I don't. Um, there's, there's, uh, I'm a lot like you, Kim, and that uh, my mind will drift and I'm like, oh, what's the argument anyway? And I back up and surge back through it. When, when I read with friends also, I do this uh, braided reading style where like what, what that means is like one person will read paragraph one then person number two will read paragraph one and two, then you'll go back, then two and three, then three, you'll just kind of keep reading. Each paragraph gets read twice and, and um, in succession, and it's kind of a way of weaving through it. It, uh, it helps quiet the mind. I find approaching Sri Aurobindo, I can't do with uh, an analytical mind. It's, it's too vast. And then, and then bringing back into what Derwin said first, how do we practice this? And Marco was also, I think everyone's talking about that, actually. How do we apply this? And I think about that in the second epigram, the uh, Vama, Gautama Vama Deva from the Rig Veda, Sri Aurobindo, quoting that as the second epigram, O oh, strength, pierce all veils. And I think that that starts, that epigram starts off threefold are these divine births and this, I, I don't quite remember what the wording is, but it, it's like he, he's always positioning us. He's always, he's always reminding us that we are an admixture of different types of consciousness. And then like mind, mind, life, physical matter has its own consciousness. Life has its own consciousness. Mind has its own consciousness. And then in, in that, in that uh, chapter, the consciousness force, I think is the first later on, he completely builds this argument out of science looking at uh, consciousness as an epiphenomenon of matter. I mean, he, he only, he's only just begun that, that argument kind of just introduced us to it. Other places, he goes, he goes off the deep end. <laughs> hmm. And Terry, I'd love to find for you the aphorism. Maybe you know it about uh, sen our senses perceive the sun rising and setting. Our rational mind perceives the earth spinning. And then he brings out, do you know this one, Terry? He brings it out to sun consciousness, but he says something like, I wish I knew it by heart. Something like Don knows it. Something about sun consciousness, just seeing everything moving in relation to each other. <laughs> yeah, it's really a beautiful aphorism. I, Don, do you know it? I just barely, it's not coming back to me, but yeah. since you I saw in the last conversation, it really hit me what you said about it being fractal. And since Marco just brought up the reading thing, I just wanted to add something about that. You'll often find at the beginning of a chapter, 
considering that Sri Aurobindo wrote 30, has 30 volumes, in one sentence or one, two sentences, he'll give you the entire integral philosophy. And then you'll read the next chapter, you go back and say, oh, I got it totally wrong last night. Now it's like, he just unfolded these undulations. And I, thought, I was trying to think, the word conscious force, I've never liked the word force, but he's translating Shakti. And it struck me as you were asking about that, when Lauren read that sentence, the, the backwaters, of the, he's taking you from the ignorance to the knowledge, to the ignorance, and he's dancing around. That dancing, when you feel that energy, that it's like the rising to the climax in the Mahler, that's the Shakti. I mean, everything's the Shakti, but, but when you really, I was thinking, I was driving, I, I take an early morning aerobics class, and I was driving through Asheville, we're in the Blue Ridge Mountains, so I'm seeing the mountains overhead, and Asheville's waking up around 7.30, and I'm seeing construction workers and people going to the bakery, getting their coffee, and there's this sense of this rising, rising, the dawn, rising force, and you feel the Shakti just like flowing through everything. And the Shakti is the pain, and it's the pleasure, and it's, but it's all delight. So there's that fractal again. It's like in each sentence of the life divine, you, you, if you, as John was saying, if you read it without analyzing it, I think, I think Marco said it too, uh, Matteo just said it, and you, you, you let it carry you, these, these, these rivers, these tor, you know, torrential flows of, of water and, and Shakti, you, you, you join the Shakti. I mean, you, you join that. I'm, I'm becoming wordless. There's nothing to say. Well, I hate to, to, to gush, but I've only, um, I've read a lot of philosophy and some of it has bored me out of my mind, but I, I persevered. <laughs> but there have been occasions um, where I, I have been very moved um, and I've wept. And it was in Plato, the symposium where Socrates is in dialogue with Diatoma, the wise woman, and she's telling, teaching him about love. I remember reading that in my early 20s, and there were tears streaming down my face. And then I said, oh, now I understand what everyone's raving about Plato for. Um, and there was a, something Ibn Arabi, um, the mystic poet, I was reading him one day at Whole Foods, a packed restaurant, and I read something that was just so stunning. I, I put the book down, and I started to sob. I couldn't believe it. It was so embarrassing. <laughs> but it, it just overwhelmed me, the, the insight of this poet into the human condition, my human condition especially. But then today at the library, it was a quiet library. No one was there. Uh, but I had, uh, I had, the tears came to my eyes. Uh, I didn't break into a sob or anything like that. But, that. but I could feel it was like an etheric. I could feel my, my subtle body was starting to uh, vibrate. It's sort of like a, you know, the hollow of a bell when it's ringing, there's that, it's vibrating. And uh, I felt it and I just went, oh, wow. And I felt the tear, the tears come to my eyes. And uh, it's like you said, it's not, um, it, it's not, um, there's cognitive portion to it, but it's also a very somatic and a cognitive sort of uh, blend. Uh, and I'm not familiar with a, a lot of the Sanskrit terminology. I'll hear it over and over again, and I'll look it up in a dictionary, and I'll read it again. I still don't know what it means. <laughs> but, but it doesn't really matter. I think he's working on such a deep level. Um, but I, do, I did want to share something, because uh, I think Lauren mentioned her, her, her child birth experience. And um, um, I think you were talking also about, Don, your, your toothache, and... When I was a kid, I was 12 years old, I had a, an accident. And I've, t I've talked about this before. This is something I'm very um, comfortable with. But um, I, had a, I was playing football and I had a, a, an accident. And I, um, I was paralyzed in my right leg uh, for about three years. And I had to wear a back brace. So from the ages of like 12 to 15, I was in a back brace. 
and all the other kids were running around and dancing and doing, you know, having fun. But uh, I went into a very introverted state stage where I was reading and I read Tostoevsky and the Greek tragedies and all this because it seemed to be the only thing that worked was tragedy. Uh, that was the only thing that relieved my my physical pain. Um, but I could, I had morphia in the, they had a, morphia is what they prescribed to me. And they said, the pain, if it really hurts, take the, take the morphia. And I can't believe they allowed a 12-year-old kid monitor his pain. <laughs> but that's what they told me to do. And I did try on occasion. I would go and I would take a pill because the pain was constant. It never stopped. And uh, But when I took the morphia, I just sort of floated and I didn't feel any pain, but I couldn't read. So I made a decision. To, well, I think it's better for me to read and have that experience of entering into other worlds than it would be just to modify the pain temporarily with a drug and, pre and prevent myself from, uh, from reading. So I think reading is something I think is, uh, and this text I think also, um, I think Jeffrey Kripal talks about mystic, mysticism and, and writing and altered states of consciousness and how we can read someone who's been dead for, for centuries, but they can, something can be evoked in us. And he, he thinks reading is a, is a telepathic transmission. So I, I, I believe that's pretty accurate, uh, that, that, that reading can be uh, telepathic. We, we enter into other times and other places and to, and to imagine futures and imagine pasts. And um, I think that uh, Aurobindo is extremely, uh, he's a great sort of spell. He's a, he creates a spell. So I think it is very magical. And I read it in big, I read it in big chunks. I read a lot uh, today and yesterday. I, I can't read them in dribs and drabs, but if I read a, you know, 30 pages at a time, I'm, I can absorb something and get that sense of uh, some, I can get a sense of the wave and I can join the wave and I can ride the wave and then the wave subsides and I, I can sort of anticipate the next wave. So it becomes a very um, sort of gentle experience, but then sometimes it gets a little turbulent and then goes, whoa, okay. You know. So it's a, uh, so it's nice to have, for me, it's a nice, quiet library. Um, it helps. Because to me, it's like entering into a very big cathedral. I mean, to me, it's just like um, um, very, uh, I, can, I can feel that sacred space he's creating through language. It's, it's very awe-inspiring. So I'm, I'm really actually a little surprised. I, I, I'd heard so much about this, and I tried to read it when I was much younger, and it didn't succeed. And, and so many people have raved about it. Um, but I was, I was prepared to be a little disappointed, but I'm not. I'm actually, uh, what the rapes that I've heard, I feel are totally justified. And I'm, I don't know why it's taking me so long to pick this up again, but I guess it's uh, the right timing for me. So th thank you. Um, thanks for sharing about your injury and that experience with your realization about reading. And it's actually almost exactly like something that I experienced. I broke my neck when I was um, 17 and I was in a neck brace for, what was it, like six months? Um, and, you know, they prescribed me medication, of course, and I didn't really want to take it. I was forced to be on it when I was in the hospital. Um, and then I think I took it for about a week after I got out, but it was, it was just before the beginning of my senior year of high school. And I was, you know, supposed to be doing a bunch of summer reading and working in a, I'm a serious student. So I was trying to do my reading and I just remember I would read a paragraph and I wouldn't understand anything I had just read. And so I would go back and I try to read just like the first sentence. And I literally could not piece together the words and understand. I thought I had damaged my brain when I fell and I broke my neck. I was like, maybe I hit my head because this is ridiculous. I can't read all of a sudden. And so I decided to stop taking the medication and I realized my pain was no different, but I could read. <laughs> and it's a and great blessing. <laughs> you know, my, my ability to read is way more important to me than numbing my senses. And, you know, a, a painkiller like that level of a painkiller doesn't even 
actually stop the pain. It just numbs your brain in a way that was, I didn't really understand. I don't, I still don't necessarily understand the lure, why some people are addicted to it. I kind of do, but to me, it's more important to tune in and that kind of trying to remove the pain in that way is like tapping out and and in some ways like it's interesting because you see a lot of people who were famous or who had a big influence on people um that are the ones that are extremely addicted to heroin um and and i think in some ways they are searching for the same thing like this connectedness that arvind is talking about um but they're looking for it in the wrong ways you know they're using a drug instead of connecting in with their higher self or whatever the life force the delight of existence so that's that's all i got to say about that <laughs> i wonder if technology is like that and uh i want to riff a little bit on the singularity theme and the relation between that and uh, global capitalism and that and um, this technological acceleration, technological evolution. The, the, the real uh, extreme development, let's say, of the material, of material, of our material, material understanding, that is to say human uh, ability to perceive what's going on at the level of matter and uh, energy physically seen and you know that being an expression of pure reason that being a mode in which uh a let's say the left brain or the calculative mind is able to gain more and more mastery over over uh material reality over over, over existence so these things being i know i'm speaking in big terms but they're they're being intimately in- related because they're expressions of a capacity that is being developed in in ourselves and not just ourselves here, but culturally and socially as a civilization, really. I'm really curious where uh, where that goes. Because <clears throat> um, clearly there's a very diluted and um, narrow and uh, not very deep, I think, uh, ideology around technological progress and that promise of being able to control nature, to create whatever we want, to um, re-engineer our own bodies, re-engineer the world. And the the real philosophical thinkers, uh, I just put that, you know, the, not necessarily that they're philosophers in the tr- traditional sense, but the people who are thinking through the implications, let's say, of, of technology uh, have wild imaginations about what, you know, science fiction, beyond science fiction level imaginations about what would be possible if AI was combined with, um, uh, you know, nanotechnology and, you know, very quantum computing and various other advanced technologies to control the material world. Now, there's also the neuroscience of it. And we talked a little bit about brainwaves and, uh, how you know different brainwave states can correlate with different uh, states of consciousness, but the really advanced neuroscience is is operating at the level of the neuron, and is attempting to model uh, how a human brain works, uh, w- in the same way that quantum physicists are attempting to model how quantum reality works by building huge super colliders and smashing particles together and seeing what happens and from from the, that phenomenon, uh, constructing a narrative about what's going on at that at that level of reality, but we're doing the same thing with the brain, and with consciousness seen through the material lens. I wonder whether Aurobindo's vision of the super mind, of the superhuman, uh, the next evolutionary unfolding of. Uh, of this divine potentiality, how much that that depends on, or um, maybe depends on isn't the right word, but will 
will dovetail with the technological evolution. And if that's the case, then maybe some of the critical perspectives I know that I harbor around uh, that mode of seeing reality, that I'd say extractive, um, colonizing, uh, dominating, uh, controlling mode, uh, which you know is what has made possible even us being here today. Of course, right? It's it's. Uh, I'm not trying to to come from an extreme, uh, uh, you know, condemning point of view on that. But I want to understand like, where the fusion is between that kind of um, sophisticated sophistication and then the interior sophistication that comes through the training of attention and through spiritual disciplines, through actually reading a, a text, uh, through um, actually practicing a yoga. Uh, I know that this is the kind of thing that organizations like Mind and Life are working on. I'm, I'm curious how Aurobindo's vision of the unfolding of, of, uh, of divine reality uh, really would, would, would see that uh, see that that the further reaches of materiality, because in Aurobindo, there's not even talk yet here of like the atom, but now we're way beyond the atom, uh, and so I wonder how far you know he he would have taken it, <laughs> and I'm open to any any thoughts on that. I have to bid farewell. I'm sorry. I would love to be part of the conversation, and I don't mean to break the capsule. I just have another meeting to get to. But thank you, everybody. Really lovely to see you and be with you. See you all next week. Thank you. Yeah. Thank mm-hmm. you, Matteo. Mm-hmm. Um, I, it's, it's interesting that the whole conversation of AI comes up. I was just kind of bored today for a minute and looking through some videos. And I watched this video of Laura Eisenhower. She's the granddaughter of President Eisenhower speaking. And she's what she was talking about was kind of all over the board. Um, but one of the things that she was mentioning was artificial intelligence and how it's inherently um, works inherently to uh, dissolve biological life. It replaces the biological and that there's this lure of like living longer and evolving with technology and it, they make it sound like it's so great. Um, and she wasn't discounting all of it. She said that there may in fact be some technologies that will be helpful in guiding us towards a new consciousness. Um, and I found that interesting because I, I also question like you do what Aurobindo would think. Um, I feel pretty solidly that he would see the human like DNA evolving and not necessarily using technology. Like, I mean, a a biological hand for somebody who loses their hand is an amazing thing. I think that that's great, but some sort of like taking over, if it takes, once it takes over our biological functions, then we cease to exist. Um, At least in, in the biological form, um, in an evolving form like that, that has a consciousness. I think that's the key point is the consciousness um and um let's see those there are a few that a friend of mine who works in the field of artificial intelligence but also his aim is to evolve our consciousness through using it and some of the things that he mentioned that i thought are are fascinating in terms of what could be positive is like a you know, the virtual reality masks that people are wearing, well, you can actually switch bodies with another person and get to feel as if you're in another body and looking around the world from someone else's point of view, even though you're sitting in this chair over here. So it's a way of like maybe like telepathic enhancement or something like that. I think it helps us play with our ability to move out of just our single body and and comprehend something more vast than that. And another um, idea is like a 
like these goggles that give you 360 degree vision. And that reminds me of some of the things that Gebser talks about. And as far as the integral consciousness and being able to like, like perceive it all at once instead of this narrow vision that we have. So those are my thoughts. I, I, I'd like to riff. If someone says something, there's so many amazing things to say. I'll see if I can riff on a few things quickly. Um, quantum. I think Marco mentioned that in the first chapter um, of the second book, Sherbindo riffs on all kinds of incredible implications of quantum physics. He was very aware of the changes happening at the time. Um, what Lauren said, the mother, Mira Alfasa, who was working on bringing the Shakti into her body, at one point she says, the organs of the body, the heart, liver, lungs, etc., will be replaced by energy centers. Just let you think of that. Um, back to the singularity and this whole technological thing. Um, Lauren just mentioned virtual reality. I took a class in, on lucid dreams with Ray Moody, the life after life guy, many years ago. Turns out he was teaching because he never had a lucid dream. He wanted to learn about it. No one in class had, no one was interested. This was an alternative school in Georgia. And when he mentioned virtual reality, everyone got excited. And I'm like, why are you getting excited about virtual reality? You know, lucid dreaming, I mean, you can not just change bodies, you can change universes. I mean, anything's possible. And I think what the, the true singularity is going to be is going to be much more of a melding of the wonders and enchantment of lucid dreaming and the dream worlds and the waking world. And what Terry mentioned before, that you know, we'll, we'll get to those worlds that we, that infants touch in, in delta wave state. But tying again what John said before about Ian McGilchrist, and it's, um, I think, I'm not sure, uh, um, wasn't here before. Um, you know, he talks about this in, intuition, which, which is the core, which is the master. And I, I've read some of Ray Kurzweil, it kind of, kind of, uh, curdles my blood. It's like he is the ultimate of Blake's, you know, Blake talked about Newton's single, save us from Newton's single vision. It's this dead Francis Crick, Carl Sagan, Richard Dawkins. It's like, we are going to, oh, what was it? Um, Bacon. We're going to rape, rape and torture mother nature, and get the secrets from her. You know, we've been doing this and the ultimate rape is going to be to replace life with a machine. I think what Kurzweil in his own way is intuiting is this new consciousness emerging. And Trier, remember, in, I think in the chapter on the ascetic, he says, well, for his time, the telegraph and the radio are symbolic of this new consciousness. That the more technology removes the visible material means, the more it's telling us, it's not about technology. It's telling us, folks, we're already one. Can't you wake up? you know, and see this so we can live this way. And I think, Marco, you were saying this earlier um, about, you know, what do you do in the world to, to bring this about? In the ideal of human unity, Shribino develops, he actually reviews empire and the, the groupings of peoples in Asia, Africa, and Europe over several thousand years. And he comes to the point saying that it's the state, the state is going to wither away. Marx was right. But we're going to have some kind of world union, but it's going to be local, a, a loose confederation of incredibly tight local, um, you know, localism, organic local living, almost like a socialist type thing, but bound together. And each local place will be infinitely different, right? And he concludes by saying what we what the French Revolution started, you know, we kind of vaguely understand liberty. We vaguely understand equality. We don't get fraternity. Fraternity is not being nice and cooperation and sweet brotherhood and sisterhood. It's recognizing the Brahman, the delight everywhere. And in that, in that delight, you know, we will discover our unity. So to come down for a moment back to real life, I just want to say something that's been striking me about Asheville. I live in Asheville, North Carolina. It's a beautiful place in the mountains. You'll notice it's, it's only three letters away from Oroville. If you take she, you take she out of Asheville, you get Oroville. 
Um, our, in terms of the chapter we're looking at, in terms of the, the chapter on delight, it's really interesting. Asheville is so many different things to so many different people. Jan and I have felt there is, there's an energy here of something trying to emerge. Asheville also is number one beer city along with Austin. To the fundamentalist senator upstate who is upset about some gay parade here, Asheville is a cesspool of sin, and you can come here and buy cesspool of sin t-shirts if you want to as a, as a visitor. Um, Asheville is also a place where sort of old hippies come and think, oh man, finally we're going to we're gonna make it work, and they all get depressed because everyone's fighting and arguing and so-and-so. But my sense is there's also people here, I was just on next, there's nextdoor.com where you talk to your neighbors. Someone wrote yesterday and just said, hi, it, there's been a lot of fighting. Okay. She went, hi, just want to say, how's everyone doing? Hope you're having a good day. And for 24 hours, there was like 40 people just writing and you could tell people were probably in tears. And there's, there's, I know that could happen anywhere. Maybe I'm just being romantic about here. But it's like the delight of the divine, it's seeking to come through in many, many different ways. But it feels like when you look at the mountains, you look at people struggling, you, you know, I'm, I'm off to my aerobics class tomorrow morning with my uh, Colombian my teacher from Colombia who's going to be doing the merengue tomorrow. And there's a sense that this delight is trying to wake up in so many ways here. Like that like that Mahler symphony that John mentioned earlier. Well, um, Don, that gives me a lot of courage, what you were just saying, um, to go into areas that I'd usually enter into with some trepidation, uh, especially about sharing personal stuff, but, and also what Marco was saying, speculating about the new technology and also Lauren's um, expressing a concern that I have about uh, artificial intelligence wiping out organic life. Um, and I think there is um, new, there is technology, the relationship between technology and consciousness is, uh, as you mentioned, in, there's um, a lot of overlaps um, because we create technology that sort of mimics um, stuff we can already do. Um, but I think, and then I think the internet is, uh, is an example of something that's happening uh, on these more subtle levels of our consciousness as we get more connected. Um, and as we start getting more facile with past and future. Um, and as more of us become uh, as, as Zorabindas was practicing paranormal, uh, studying the paranormal, the psychic, telepathy, remote viewing, um, being able to, to uh, work psychically, psychically with forces subtle level at the subtle level during Hitler's um, regime. Um, and his recording of all of his experiments, I think is extremely interesting. Uh, and I, I just wouldn't... I had one experience, and I think the reason I'm sharing this has to do with um, being influenced by uh, certain theorists and thinkers like um, uh, Jeffrey Kripal, who writes a lot, who's a religious scholar, but he writes a lot on the paranormal. And um, he's also written a book with Whitley Stryber, who wrote Communion. I don't know if you guys remember that famous movie with uh, Walken, um, these extraterrestrials who are performing all kinds of experiments with him. Um, and um, some of the, the, the speculation around those reports, and Whitley Stryber, of course, a very good writer and has made a very popular part of pop culture. Um, but I think it's, um, also Carl Jung wrote a lot about this too. Um, but there are a lot of people who are saying it's not out there um, that these, uh, superior intelligences would not be coming in, you know, big spaceships and landing on, on, um, in, in Washington, displaying um, their advanced technology. It would be on the inner planes that they would be contact, making contact. And um, 
I remember, and I've had lots of these episodes. So it's, I've had a lot of lucid dreaming is certainly something that a practice that you can learn. Um, it takes a little, some practice, a lot of skill, and that comes and goes with me. I'm not, I can't do it like that. But I, if I prime myself and work at it, I can become very active lucid dreamer. Um, and I've had a lot of out-of-body experiences. I've also had a lot of physical trauma. And I've also uh, accompanied a lot of people during the last stages of their lives. So I've taken care of a lot of people who were sick. And when they died, I had some intense imprints. Um, and I think one episode, and I think I've told, the, told you this, this before, but I was in a lucid dream and I was in a laboratory atmosphere and there, was compu- there were computers there. And I asked out loud, is there, anyone, is there someone here who can help me? And this man came forward with a lab coat, I kid you not. And he said, we can't help you, but you can help us. And I said, what, what do you want me to do? And he said, we'd like to study your brain. And I said, sure. And he, because I trusted the guy. And he told me to look into the, 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 uh, the, flat, the screen. And he said, and there's a blue light there. And he said, look at the light. And it, it shot a bolt of light into my my cranium, my dream head, right? So, and there was action going on and I sort of made a figure eight and then it went back into the, the screen and he said, thank you very much. And I went back into my physical body and I could still feel this buzzing inside my head for a while. And I was very perplexed by it. But I think the, um, I think that these, these kind of energetic uh, experiences that you can have I mean, Aurobindo is coming from Vedanta and from a whole different kind of mythology. And I come from, you know, Hollywood science fiction movies and from, you know, um, lab- men in white coats and laboratories. It sort of fits my model of the world. So I think these kinds of, um, but I think, uh, but anyway, the speculation here, and this is wildly speculative, and I think we are going to have to be wildly speculative if we are going to make it. Uh, so I think sp- speculation will generate our imaginations um, because we're going to need our healthiest imaginations, I think, to deal with the crises that we're facing. But these are the uh, Whitley Stryber and um, another uh, philosopher I'm reading, Giorgiani is his last name. He talks about the future, that there these are entities from our future who are, who are, uh, some members of our species are getting mutated at a faster rate. And some of these mutations are, and I think Gebser and Arabindo are probably sensitive to these mutations in consciousness, these new, these potential new structures that may start to emerge. Because I think they were being updated in their own way and through the traditions that they were practicing. Um, but I think this idea seems really um, pretty obvious to me that the mutations of consciousness, there are going to be some people there are going to be who are fast forwarding into these, the, and they will sometimes be scary. They are often, as Whitley Stryber and as Kripal mentions, extremely erotic, very sexually charged. And sometimes that's very threatening to some people. Um, so I think that um, it's very curious because this, uh, that guy named Philip Corso, he was a colonel. He's the, he's the guy who reported that he saw the bodies of um, some, some extraterrestrials. And uh, this is back in the, in the early, late 50s. Um, and he said that the extraterrestrials claimed that they were from our future and that they had communicated this and um, that they had some technology. And they said they made, I don't know who they were talking to exactly but they were um, communicating that they are from a fi- our future and it was a future that failed and they're coming back to update us and not just to update us to get to their level, but to get to a level that was beyond them because they fucked up really bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we're all getting these fast forwards and I think we're getting flashbacks and at the same time. And as you, if you, certain kind of meditation, certainly 
facilitated uh, trance states, uh, hypnosis. Um, we can do phenomenal things that we can't do in, in our conscious waking state. And I think that, um, uh, I think your uh, descriptions of lucid dreaming, these are, are, are skills that I think can be stabilized if enough people could stabilize those uh, sort of esoteric practices. And then also continue with our scientific curiosity and um, you know, come up with the best maps that we can. I think it'll be a different kind of technology that we would be creating than a technology that's basically just privileging um, that, that monophasic dimension of consciousness and manipulating it for the benefits of a few at the great uh, and the great sacrifice at the many. So I think we're in, um, at the very least, I think this is a, a different mythology. Um, Cause I, uh, I think a lot of the answer to our dystopia, our dystopians um, imagine, our imagination is we need some new myths. And anyway, I found this one a very compelling one and sort of matches my own uh, experience of the incredibly weird and the, the, the paranormal, those anomalies that the rational tries to sweep under the rug and pathologizes. So I think, um, uh, I think that's, it's getting harder and harder for that reductive um, kind of science to dominate. Um, and I think, you know, we'll see what happens next. But I think uh, reading Aurobindo is a, a definitely um, a training for me. I feel like it's a training manual. So thanks. Marco, I'm, I'm really interested in your, uh, in your interest in the singularity. And so I'm, mostly I have questions about it more than anything. So like one of the questions I have is, is about consciousness. Is consciousness in the brain or is the brain inside of consciousness? <laughs> so if, if the brain is inside of consciousness, which I have to admit I have a, uh, kind of a preference for, then technology is also inside of consciousness, I would say. And so it's a tool that could be used in many, many wonderful ways, if that is true. And that's just another kind of flip of the way of thinking about, about things. And when Aurobindo talks about involution, I think he is really in kind of pointing to the fact that, that consciousness uh, comes into us we're receiving it us uh, you know and um so uh you know looking at it from that perspective is really a fascinating process my mother does just died about three years ago and when i think about the singularity and the possibility of of increasing our lifespan as a result of it um i uh i remember her because she was 94 and she didn't want to live any longer. She was healthy. She was cleaning out drawers a day or two before she died. But she she had lived a long, good life, and, and she thought it was ridiculous that anybody would want to live 400 years. She, she said, you know, you're going to get sick of living after a while, you know. Uh, so there's probably another better place for me to go. And so she died with a grin on her face, you know, and what more could you ask for uh, when it comes to comes to death? But when it comes to technology, I'm thinking, how long will it take for all of us to realize uh, uh, the greatest kind of consciousness is possible for human beings? And maybe 94 years is not long enough for people like me. Maybe, maybe I'm going to need to live longer. So maybe an artificial heart and kidney will help me live long enough so that I can realize some of the things that I maybe would like to. I don't know. Those are the kinds of questions that I play with in my mind. I don't know if they're worth anything, but I appreciated your your question uh, a lot. And um, I don't have any answers about it. I'm pretty sure technology is going to happen. I just think that it's kind of un an unpredictable kind of thing right now. So thanks for listening. Well, same. 
I'd, I'd love to respond, but I also um, realize we're at the top of the hour, and I would like to invite any um, anyone else to uh, share their closing thoughts for, for now. I, I am writing a poem. It's called I Am the Singularity, and part of my uh, part of the reason for my curiosity and interest is because uh, I'm I'm trying to write this poem, and so uh, I have to understand what I'm what I'm writing about in order to transmute it into a literary um, performance. So, uh, but the, in a nutshell, the premise of the poem is the reversal, just like you were talking about. Instead of seeing the singularity as <clears throat> this event that happens out there when Google and Microsoft and Apple all merge, and you know the world you know, turns into their playground or something like that, I would see it as something happening within myself. And, uh, and this poem would be an expression of, of that process, um, bearing some kind of fruit. So, uh, and I intuit that if I were to finish, I mean, the poem is sort of an external artifact in a way, but something about writing it is a rite of passage for me into potentially that, uh, that, becoming that being whatever whatever is on the other side you know so um so i'm very passionately and urgently urgently curious uh, actually about it um probably probably more than i let on uh, and with that I'll, I'll let others uh share their closing thoughts i just have one closing thought and it's uh, a brief it's a footnote I use the word intuition for want of a better. In truth, it is a makeshift and inadequate to the connotation demanded of it. The same has to be said of the word consciousness and many others which our poverty compels us to extend illegitimately in their significance. So I think he was wrestling with that vocabulary just as we are. It's very inadequate what we have. That's why we mean get poets. I've never done Zoom before. I've, I've never been invited many times. And this is just about the greatest way to experience it for the first time. So thank you all. Yeah, I've got a nice short little poem. <laughs> it's more of a little ditty, I suppose. But. So I now see clear and will live without fear for the singularity is nearer and all is much dearer. Um, I had maybe five or 10 minutes of comments running through my head of what I wish to respond to all of you, but um, in Homo Deus, the uh, Yuval Harari, uh, he, he's stating that we're, we're all telling stories to ourselves, that humanity has been telling stories since the dawn of religion, and now we're, we're, we've kind of got the algorithmic story. We're telling ourselves that more information, more of this will define who we are, will get at consciousness in the brain. And I, in a way, I almost see Aurobindo was maybe the first to like just take everything out of his brain and place it onto paper or one of, one of the, the best at clarifying everything that's going on in his head. Um, but I tell a, a story to my son each night. Uh, if I'm ever late here, it's probably because uh, he, he went to bed a little bit later. So I had to make sure I told that story to him. Um, but I've, I've thought about recording my, in a daily journal, what I do. I've thought about writing all sorts of stories about my experiences to him. And I, I cut all that out for whatever reason. In a way, there's, I, I feel like we're going back to a storytelling society, at least like the Zoom conversation right now is a story of sorts and it's recorded, it's there, but uh, it's going into some sort of archive and it's, it's a piece of information that perhaps my son will never see. Um, and I, I could have it situated inside an external hard drive for him to examine once I'm gone and say, oh, here's the story of my life. I left this for you. But um, 
he, he probably won't have time for that. His, his life is going to be accelerating even more than our lives here. And as we accelerate more and more, as we, it, it, it's good and bad, it's great and not so great. It's, it's amazing and it's horrible. It just depletes the earth and it also gives us a whole new earth at the same time. And that's once you recognize the opposites, once you tap into seeing all of it, 360 degrees, whatever you're able to, or maybe only tunnel vision uh, for a lot of us. But um, I feel, feel that technology will play its role and for better or for worse. And there's so much more I'd like to say about that, but we're at the end of the conversation here. So I'll give room for anyone else to speak. Hi, I agree. There's so much more we could talk about on this um, topic. And I'm not really sure exactly what to say upon ending because I have so many ideas in my mind right now. Um, I, one of the things that it reminded me of though was Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and how people ha have a pretty wide misconception about how the book ends. Um, he, this Dr. Frankenstein ends up destroying Frankenstein realizes that it was a horrible idea. And, um, he couldn't allow it to procreate. Um, so he destroys it and it's, she's kind of talking about the same ideas of artificial intelligence here today that we're facing. Um, my son just woke up, so I'm going to have to run to him. Um, I would love to hear Don though, right? That's your name. Yeah. Don, um, a little bit more about what you think the mother meant by that when she said that our organs of the body would become, what was it vehicles of light or energy centers? Is that what you said? Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd be curious to hear what you have to say. And otherwise, I guess until next time. <laughs> I assume that's next time. Right? Yeah, yeah. And the farm, please use the farm too. As you've been doing, Don. Anyone else? I just enjoyed um, people's thoughts. And I really enjoyed Terry's question. Um, I like how uh, it sort of oriented me, sort of like to switch kind of back and forth and go, oh, kind of feel through, oh yeah, what does it feel like to take, oh yeah, oh yeah, what if, you know. So I, I like the question because I felt like that gave me the space to explore um, sort of my own orientation and bias of how I hold that. Um, I work for a technology company that promises and sells the future of AI and um, machine learning and augmented realities and digital twins. And I get enough of that at work. <laughs> um, and I certainly uh, don't uh, have a lot of illusions about sort of um, what I feel like our immediate capacities are, capacities are as an organization. Um, I, I see some very interesting things that it's doing for me. Um, in just the way that I understand time and space, um, and the way that I sort of understand synchronous and asynchronous communications and my own capacities on forms like this at work. Uh, oddly enough, at work, we hardly ever use video. <laughs> it's all conference calls, uh, even though it's voice over IP, it's all auditory. So basically for the last seven years, been doing nothing but connecting with people all over the world. Um, through voice in different timelines. So just this playing with time and this idea of like how we collaborate, how we connect and how we sort of manage projects when none of us work in the same space. So it's like having this shared idea in this thing that we're actually creating together. Um, and then my workspace is a very concrete thing, or at least it was when we started. 
but I'll be honest with you, um, in many, many ways, we have literally no idea what's going on <laughs> most days. I mean, I have a sort of like a general direction that we're going, but I found there's uh, a much higher degree of chaos in terms of um, our ability to have to sort of modify what we thought we were going to be doing and the technologies we're doing it with. And even just the emerging and integrating of different organizations and new colleagues and networks and security and it's just sort of like, when you really think about it, it's like, wow, how do we get anything done? I was thinking about that today. Like, I'm surprised that we can get anything done. <laughs> and somehow we sort of like uh, stumble forward nonetheless. So um, I'm fascinated early on in the book when he talks about sort of, I guess for his time period, right? The Telegraph was kind of a big deal. <laughs> um, so like just how time is just sort of uh, in space or just sort of, really just something we can play with really like actually with technology. Um, but what I found in my own personal subtle body sort of awareness, it's like I have like very difficult time distinguishing like when somebody's actually physically present with me or not, like it doesn't matter. I can just feel people when their attention or my attention is in a particular way. So in that sense, my, um, which I won't say it was entirely comfortable as that developed, <laughs> um, but the um, like the sense of just like the interconnectivity. In Orbendo talks about this sort of like progression of like matter in um, you know nature, life. Like I forget how he kind of like stacks it. But this last weekend, I was in New York City listening to Sharon Salzberg and uh, Dan Siegel. And it blew my mind because uh, Dan Siegel uses so much language. It's like almost like it's directly out of this text. Uh-huh. It just blows my mind. And he's like a interpersonal neurobiologist. It's his specialty. And so like he was ultimately he reached like a, a brick wall with his research. And someone was like, well, you got to go see Sharon. You know, and she's sort of like the loving kindness person. So watching the two of them on stage and, I have a sort of a history with Dan uh, at public events where like, uh, I think I terrify him because sort of like spatially, but anytime I get near him, he's like, Phew. and uh, my boyfriend was actually watching. I told him about this. And my boyfriend was actually watching it happen in New York. So um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting things going on, but um, more immediately, I would say uh, the technology thing is happening and people are, you know, using that for how they're going to use it. I think consciousness if you're sort of tuned in, it's like a, it's already sort of a vehicle for a, a stage of awakening. Um, but what I'm beginning to experience is more of the aliveness of my day to day in a way that Don was sort of talking about a little bit. Um, sort of like this aliveness and this interconnectedness with my environment, sort of like in a felt sense where things are sort of co-arising at the same time. Like I, I'm not really sure, you know, where my attention sort of moves things that I am moved by, those things around me and there's this sort of like emergent quality to um, what I'm able to notice in my environment. So I'm interested in technology, but I'm far more interested in sort of um, what these subtle organs are um, in relationship to each other. And also, you know, technology is a part of that. I think I have a kind of, if I understood Terry correctly, a more relaxed sort of, um, attitude about technology like I accept that it's part of our process and it's there but I don't depend on it entirely for the solution to what's um, what is our awakening so that's my riff for the night <laughs> thank you I'm thank you. sorry I gotta do a quick shout out for Dan Siegel my favorite book on education in the, in the whole universe is The Mother in Education <laughs> and I've been looking for something like that in 2012, Jen and I started a website, Remember to Breathe. The entire website is using Dan Siegel stuff. He's like, love him. so cool. Every kid that I see for psyche valves, I say, get the whole brain child. So that's all. He's got, he's got a new book coming out called Aware. Um, yeah, check it out. <laughs> and he talks to dead people, too. I, I heard him with Almas. They had a conversation where Siegel talks about having a conversation with a friend of his who had recently died. And he said, oh, I, I maybe shouldn't be talking about this in public. <laughs> so, 
So I think well, you're describing this, something like technology can be complementary to your experience rather than in opposition to or, in, or dominating your experience. And that would be my hope that there could be a healthy complementing of, um, rather than a domination by a very narrow focus. And that, that fragments even further our fragile ecosystems. It's a very real danger. So who knows? Thank you all very much. Yeah. Very stimulating. Um, should we take maybe just a, one minute, a little quiet meditation to transition to uh, the rest of our, li our lives? Um, I have a little device here. What's this? Just like a minute. And then uh, I'll unmute us all too so we can all say bye before we hang up. Next time. Bye, bye. 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 Bye, little one. Bye. Bye. Use your voice. Bye. 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 bye.